This is good. And Jeff's just come in. Good. Oh, okay. Hello. Hi, Jim and I were over at hey, someplace hey, hey, else. Hey. Jim and I were over talking. We're just starting. We've had we've had gremlins, so I'm I'm just starting the show. Thanks, Jeff. We're we've uh, anybody who's been waiting, uh, thank you for waiting. And um, the new changes at Google have really uh, put a little uh, spin in our uh, top here. So <laughs> I'm Cara Riley here with the Landscape Photography Show, and we have a wonderful guest uh, today, uh, David Mark going to be sharing on Lightroom 5 beta but before we wanted to start um, we had a few people wanting to just send out some light and love to those in Oklahoma um, we're all um, just with them in spirit, uh, just sending love, and there have been many uh, posts on how you can help with donations, but uh, I'm going to uh, move this right over to Margaret, had a few words that she wanted to say before we got going, and uh, then we'll get right to our show. Thanks, Cara. Um, I think I speak on behalf of our whole team that our hearts and prayers, uh, thoughts really go out to the victims of the terrible tornadoes that tore through Oklahoma. And uh, we're hoping the very best uh, for them. Uh, I'm, I'm a personal uh, survivor of a tornado, and uh, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Uh, so they're just devastating, and I know the great sense of uh, loss and struggle that those people are dealing with now. And um, uh, uh, certainly my, my prayers and our thoughts uh, go out to them. Um, I'll post a link. Um, the, uh, NBC News had a wonderful whole page on, on how you can help. So we'll post that as part of our notes for this week's show. Uh, so any of you who are interested uh, and want to reach out and help uh, some of your fellow uh, photographers that might be down there in Oklahoma City, we'll certainly make that available uh, to you. So um, that's it, Cara. Back to you. Thank oh. you. Thank you, Margaret. And um, I know that uh, David had a few words to say. He's getting ready for um, a show or a, a, a class in Oklahoma. And so I know he wanted to say a few things too before we get started. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, my hearts and prayers and feelings go out to everyone there. Um, I'm supposed to teach a class, a Lightroom class in Oklahoma City in about two weeks. I was in Wichita a week ago, and uh, I just hope everyone, I just wish everyone the best. Uh, I feel real bad that, uh, that by luck I'm, I'm here and not there, and, and wish everyone well. Thank you. Thank you, David. So, all right. Well, we'll go ahead and, and get started here. We, <laughs> we had a few gremlins going on uh, for uh, quite a while here. So if you're still with us, we want to thank you. And those of you who are watching it recorded, uh, those live viewers had to wait. Now we're we are monitoring the um, the uh, page, the landscape photography page, and uh, the landscape photography show page, landscape photography show page, where you can ask questions during the live show. So that's the only place we'll be monitoring the comments and the URL that was put out to begin with had to be changed because we had to go out and come back in, which is sometimes happens uh, when you got new stuff and we just had the new changes. And this that's a good segue, isn't it, David? Uh, um, just going right into <laughs> beta testing of Lightroom. <laughs> but uh, for First, I'll introduce uh, myself. I'm Cara Riley, a small business uh, uh, consultant and uh, founder of the Photo Tour Global Directory. And just am excited to be on this team of curators in the landscape photography um, theme. And Margaret was the founder of the landscape photography theme. 
So she'll say a few words. Hi, uh, Cara. It's good to be with you uh, tonight. Uh, I'm Margaret Tompkins from Kansas City, Missouri and uh, the chief curator of the landscape photography theme and I also do some curating over uh, in the landscape photography community and a few other themes that are on uh, Google Plus. Uh, I'm retired and an amateur photographer and just love to get out there and take uh, uh, landscape shots and then great uh, people like uh, David Marks here comes along and, and tells me how I can process those to make them look truly outstanding. So. Looking forward to this show tonight. And we'll go to we'll go to Tom now. Introduce yourself, Tom. Well, Tom, can you introduce yourself? <laughs> I guess we got some uh, big audio issues here, so we're going to jump right to Jim. Jim, Jim can tell us who he, what he does. Yeah, the Gremlins are with us tonight. So um, <laughs> I'm. Uh, I'm an amateur enthusiast, I suppose. Uh, I'm not retired uh, yet, anyway. And and uh, but I uh, am based in Phoenix, Arizona. So I I really love doing uh, landscape photography, both color and black and white. Um, and along with Margaret, I curate the landscape photography theme, and also am a moderator in the landscape photography community. Well, that's great. And then we have Jeff. Jeff, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Jeff Beto. I'm uh, talking to you from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And uh, I've been a photographer since about 1963 or 4. And uh, landscape is my uh, form of choice. I'm pretty conversant with uh, both newer digital technology and also I have a operating darkroom and uh, 8 by 10 uh, film camera that I still use. Well, that's great. Okay, so now, now it's back to me to introduce our guest. Um, and uh, David has been with us, and he did, and we will include this in our notes. Uh, he did a show for us on 3D modeling using Google Earth, and he also did a show on um, black and white, thinking in black and white. And both of those shows, David, have modified my photography behavior. <laughs> <laughs> the, the day we did the uh, show where we were doing the 3D modeling, I, or I guess the black and white, I had been uh, on a photo walk up to the uh, where they have the yuccas, and uh, I, I was exhausted. <laughs> So now I'm really excited to have you back. The, the one thing that I would really like to share um, about David is that he really walks the walk. He uh, t has been and is a professional photographer, had things published um, in National Geographic. All of us can be one of these, Ski Magazine, um, uh, Outside Magazine, and uh, just really a wonderful trainer and educator. Um, and some educators are very hard to follow. David really uh, sets the bar with um, easy to follow, has wonderful tutorials, and we'll have all those links uh, on our notes. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce David Marks, who will be sharing beta testing for Lightroom 5. So, David. Well, well thank you so much. Uh, thanks, thanks, everyone uh, on the, in the Hangout here and everyone who's tuning in. Um, I, I really, I, I have to say, I, I feel so blessed that uh, I love photography and I've been able to make a career in it in no way the career I thought I would have. Um, when I went to photography school, I was trained in a dark room. We had film. And here I am uh, sitting at a computer all day running around with a digital camera. So it, it has been an awful lot of luck, uh, but it's an awful lot of fun. And um, I feel so blessed that, that I get to go out and take pictures of things I like and then do what I want with them when I get home. And so I thought for tonight's, uh, for tonight's broadcast that uh, the timing was just perfect that the next version of Lightroom is due out sometime within the next month or two. Now I have to say here, I don't work for Adobe. I'm not a shareholder. I'm not an employee. Um, and so 
like every, like so many of us, I, I pay for their products. I love their products, um, but I have no secret inside knowledge. So if you're if you're going to ask about the price of Lightroom Five or the release date, I have no idea. Uh, I'll be as stunned as anyone else. Um, but I have had the opportunity uh, to to test some software for them, including uh, many of the versions of Lightroom. And so everything I thought I would show tonight is in the public Lightroom beta. It's a sign of, of what will be available uh, when it comes out. And there's, there's a couple of new features that I thought uh, landscape photographers might, might really be interested in. Uh, so here, I'm going to try and share my screen. Uh, you all let me know if this, if this goes tragically wrong. Let's see here. Hang on one second. Uh, sometimes the screen sharing, uh, you holler if, if something goes crazy. Um, so let's see. So now, if I minimize this window, um, can you see Lightroom at this point? No, we see a gray screen with your pictures on the left. Now we see. I, I see yeah. Lightroom. Awesome. Yeah, yeah I see awesome. It. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, Lightroom Five, uh, or the beta of Lightroom Five. I should stress that. Um, Everything you see in the beta is somewhat experimental, and, and I do think it's worth pointing out that, uh, that there are bugs, that things crash, that things don't work perfectly yet. The Adobe team, they release these betas to get feedback uh, from the public, and that helps them make the, the product when it comes up for sale that much more stable, robust, uh, intuitive, but it means that if you play with the beta, that you are in some ways playing with fire. It's not perfect yet. Um, so I, I really enjoy experimenting with it, but I would not use it full time for production use uh, every day until it's for sale. And then I think it'll be great. Uh, but what I thought I would show tonight, I thought I would show a couple of features that, that I really am just so excited about. Um, and we'll start with, uh, we'll start with what in the Photoshop world would be called content-aware healing. In the Lightroom world, um, we're going to call it a more robust uh, spot or object removal brush. And, and Margaret, since you and I have talked about the Grand Canyon a couple of times, I thought I would pick uh, some rafting photos for this one. Hmm. Oh, awesome subject. Uh, Wonderful. Uh, hopefully you can see a, a photo of a bunch of people in the raft, I hope. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I hope that works. Um, yes. Awesome. So uh, I'll admit here that the person rowing is actually me. Um, in a sense, this is a self-portrait. Um, I rigged up a camera that I could fire from a foot trigger while I was rowing the raft, uh, which is a project that involved a welder and underwater cable and housing and just got totally carried away. But I love the results. I love these first-person point of view uh, kind of photos. In the days before the GoPro, these used to be really hard to make. And now with the GoPro, they're easy. But um, I love this photo. And, and you know, I knew that, Cara, you were going to talk about my, my career in photography, though I really think that's greatly overstated. Uh, but one, one part of photography is the stock, stock photography world. And in stock photography, Something like the logo on this life jacket right here, that's a problem. The problem is that if your photo has recognizable logos, they are trademarked material. And, and they would also say, so not only would there be trouble uh, if I try and sell this in stock, but also, uh, obviously, right now, this photo advertises one company's life jacket. So basically, this has to go. Now, it's sewed on to the back of my life jacket, so it's not like I can physically remove it. So this is the kind of thing that we have to do in post-processing. Now, up till now in Lightroom, we've had a round healing brush that was great for dust spots. And I could try and make little round covers over that, but the results are smudgy. They're not great. So this is the kind of thing, removing something like this, that I used to have to do in Photoshop. But in Lightroom 5, they're bringing what in Photoshop we would call the content-aware healing brush 
uh, to the table. So let me zoom this in just a little further. This. I'm going to take the new Content Aware Healing Brush, and I'm just going to run it over that logo, and I'm going to let go. And logo? What logo? Wow. Can you see? Can you see? Fast. Yeah, fast. And do you notice how there's even still a pattern to the life jacket? That mm -hmm. it may be hard to see across the broadcast, but there is a texture created there that that would otherwise disappear. Uh, here, I'll, I'll show you. Uh, change photos, show you the same trick again, because I think a lot of photographers are going to love this this ability to remove something, something small uh, from our photos. Here's another life jacket, another logo. For a stock photographer, this used to mean a trip from Lightroom to Photoshop and back again. Here, let me zoom out so you can see the whole photo real quick. Uh, this is the beginning of the Grand Canyon. Uh, here we are, uh, Lee's Ferry, for folks uh, fo floating under the, the bridge at, at Lee's Ferry. Um, so to remove this logo, all I have to do now is just like Photoshop, I just take the new healing brush, I drag a swipe across it, it decides what to copy, only in this case, I think it would be better if it copied from down here, and when I close this logo, what logo? Here, I'm going to split the screen so you can see a before. I think that's just astounding. Uh, for the amount of effort I just put in that, to have such an amazingly rich, detailed, patterned image uh, without having to go to Photoshop, I know that for someone like me, this is going to be an enormous time saver. Um, and I'll go, I'll go one further here. Do you see these flare spots? Mm -hmm. yeah. Those flare spots are a hard thing to remove in a lot of programs. But now I think I'm going to be able to do a decent job by painting over the flare spot and letting it invent a pattern of cliff wall to slap in right there. And maybe I'll fade the opacity of that back just a little, something about like that, and the same up here. and. That's going to be a little too dark, but we'll bring this up and over. And what we're really doing is inventing information where no information would otherwise exist so that when I'm done, let me hit close here, uh, compare the before and after. Let's see if you can see the view here. Flare spots? What flare spots? Yeah. Wow. Nice. Yeah. Now, again, this is something that for folks with a background in Photoshop, we've been doing this for years in Photoshop. But for those, for those who work only in Lightroom, this has been uh, sort of an impossible dream up till now. Uh, so I'm, I'm just thrilled with that one. And I'll show you one last on this. Um, let me change images here. Uh, this is uh, Bryce Canyon, gorgeous national park. Absolutely love Bryce. I love this. I would like to love this photo. Uh, I was there finally on like an overcast thunderstorm kind of day. You know, I, and finally there was something other than just uh, blue sky. And uh, I thought I was getting great photos. But when I got home, you see this big hair right here? And the, now, how I didn't notice this was stuck to my lens or my sensor. I mean, sometimes I just can't <laughs> believe what I don't see when I hold the camera, like how do I get such tunnel vision that I don't notice a hair running across the whole the whole viewfinder but this has got to go uh, for this to be a usable image so again to remove this in Lightroom up till now would have been impossible because all we could do we could have made little spots, little overlapping circles but the results would have been just an utter mess if I zoom in it just gets it get well that looks disturbingly good on my screen, but pretend yeah, that yeah, didn't look so good. Uh, <laughs> pr pretend that didn't look so good. And, and I, I think that for the folks out there who've been working with something like Lightroom, uh, hairs, power lines, you know, like Lightroom's dust brush was great for this. It was great for a round circular dust spot. This no problem. We've been zapping things mm -hmm. like that for years, but when we got to something that was call it linear, uh, it was a disaster 
because we were trying to cover a line with a sequence of circles. Well, now, now we can take our brush, and I can literally, I can click here, and when I come down here and use a, a shift click to draw what I want it to do, and it will copy some sky and make a whole new pattern. And if I position this just about right, I'm, I don't think the results are going to be perfect on the first try. But if I position this about right, let's see. When I hit close, let's see how that looks. Eh, we'll do a second stripe. We'll do another. Seems like there's a little edge still right about there. So we'll do a second stripe. And we'll let it copy. And now I, I have to ask, hair? What hair? So here, let me show a comparison. That's without. Now, it's not perfect. There's still some cleanup left to be done. But I love how there is a pattern to the sky uh, that, that we're getting to something I would consider a usable image where when it looked like this, that was pretty much a... Um, does that make sense? That's, that's really quite incredible. Yeah, I, I think that the, the, for Lightroom users, the addition of what in Photoshop is called content-aware logic is just going to be so helpful. It's something I know that, that I've wanted um, for six, seven years now. Along the same lines, um, this is a minor one in some ways, but there is now a new feature in the spot removal tool. And, and so I have this photo that I, that I like a lot. Uh, this is a sun dog. In the winter, we get these crazy uh, vertical rainbows. Um, and I'm going to make the photo a whole lot darker than, it, than I ordinarily would. And I'm going to make it a whole lot higher contrast. And the reason I'm going to do this is so you can see these dust spots or water spots up here in the sky. Can you see, uh, like, this big spot right here? Let me zoom in even. Oops, let me zoom in one further. Apologies. Let's go. See that spot right there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and there's another here, another here, another here. And I think what had happened, either I have the dirtiest sensor on Earth, or uh, little snowflakes had landed on my lens as I was out skiing, and they'd melted. And I think these are little water spots on the lens. Well, the thing is, this photo is full of them. There's more up here, and there's more over here. And nothing's going to show off spots like a blue sky. So for a while, I've been using this trick where I make the photo darker and higher contrast to try and help me find the spots. But now there's a new feature that they're calling the Visualize Dust Spots tool. And what it's going to do, it's going to make the photo go black and white. But it's going to show the things that they think are dust spots as a uh, white circle on the screen. So I don't know if you can see it now, but do you see how like in black and white there's now that circle right there? Mm -hmm. That's its guess at what is a dust spot. Now I can I can control the radius of its detection with this slider here, and I don't want to say it's perfect. I don't mean to say that I would only look at my photo in this black and white mode, but boy, once you learn the keyboard shortcut for it, uh, and the keyboard shortcut is the letter A. Uh, once you learn the shortcut to just flip back and forth and say dust spot, dust spot, um, there's one right here, dust spot, and I'm not going to remove all of them. That would make for a very boring show. But uh, uh, but compare, you know, let me undo what I've just done. Spots, lots of spots. Finding all of the spots in our photo has been such a it's been complicated up till now. So it's visualize dust spots logic that looks for that that makes the photo a black and white. Let me zoom out a little um, so that you get a. Wow. Let's find oops all these spots over here floating in the sky, all these spots up here. Let me zoom out even one more if I can. Having this this extra helper. I think a lot of photographers are going to love that yeah. one. Yeah. David, uh, we've been talking about another show coming up in the future where we're going to talk about cleaning sensors. You might 
Oh, um, that would that's that's a show that's a show I need to listen in on. There's a there's a old trick for the if you're not sure if it's a spot on your sensor or if it's some other cause, take a picture of a blank wall that's evenly lit, and then go into Photoshop, go to levels, and do auto. And when it auto levels a, a gray or blank, uh, evenly toned wall, you'll get a very high contrast picture of the dust spots on your sensor. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Uh, and, and the truth is, actually, I, I, uh, I do clean my sensor regularly, but I really like photographing around snow and sand, and I, I like going places where there's an awful lot of stuff to si stick to it. Um, here, I'll show you one last, one last little Lightroom trick while we're on this dust trouble. In this photo, there is something stuck to my lens that is so large that I shouldn't need any help to find it, this, <laughs> like, lima bean. But just to show off the, the spot removal again, uh, I love how it isolates that one. And in fact, it also shows me this one and this <laughs> one and this one. There are an awful lot of spots in there that is the white snow. I actually don't see very well. And, and so I actually think that using this trick is going to help me find spots that I might not otherwise have found until I made a great big print, say. Right. And, sure. and I, I hate that method, when you pay to find your spots. Yep. Uh, yeah, always disappointing. Well, here, I thought I would just show one old Lightroom trick, which is this. In Lightroom, you can copy and paste what you do from one photo to another. Now for this to make sense, uh, let me hop show you that when I shoot my skiing, uh, or skiers, uh, a burst of frames, so this is one frame, and then this is another frame uh, from like a four hundredth of a second later. And the skier has moved, but the spot is in both of them, or I should say all of the spots are in both of them. So this is an old trick, but in Lightroom what I can I can go to that photo. I can zap the spot. Oops, this guy here. So let me remove that. Oop, oh my goodness. That's too much. That to do. Hang on one second there. I just want to I'll zap this one too just for the doing of the thing. Pretend I cleaned up this whole photo. If I clean up the whole photo and if the skier doesn't move into that area I told it to copy. Because what we're really doing in Lightroom is defining a relationship. We're saying copy from here, paste to there. Copy from here, paste to there. So we have to be careful when we have motion that nothing moves into the copy from zone. But if I fix this one and I like what I did, I can go to the next one or if I had a whole sequence of them and say do exactly what I did on the last one on this one. I can use the sync command or synchronize or in this case I can use the previous command to say everything I did previously, the last photo, do that here too. So in a single click, big old lima bean, what lima bean stuck to my camera? So I love this ability to now find our spots coupled with Lightroom's ability to synchronize where I can clean a photo and hopefully send some of that to all the others. So that when it's said and done, I have two photos that look like this, and none of them that look like, uh, well, the one with the big nasty thing stuck to it that we started with. Um, okay, so, so the, the Lightroom 5's ability to help us clean up our photos is, is pretty neat. Um, questions before I, I hop over to another, another idea? Well, we do have some people that did find the new URL, so they're out there. <laughs> awesome. No questions yet, but they're there. <laughs> All right. Well, here, uh, let me show you a little other bit of magic then. Uh, uh, so in the new Lightroom, in, in the Lightroom 5 beta, you might have an oceanscape like this one. And when we photograph oceans, buildings, lakes, the horizon line is really important. That if the horizon isn't level, when we hang it on the wall, it, it always seems tilted, you know, like you always want to change the frame, uh, you want to tilt it a little, uh, that, that we expect the ocean to have a flat horizon, not to sort of flow off the page. So 
for a long time, we've been trying to fix our tilted horizons with the crop tool. We'd come in here and we'd do something like this, and then we would rotate the crop around. And that's, that's still true, but a lot of times we were guesstimating at how much angle we needed. And there was even this measure tool where we could try and come in here and measure the, uh, the tilt with the measure tool like this, and then that would snap the crop for us to make it nice and level. But it, in the new Lightroom, in Lightroom 5 Beta, there's a very interesting new feature down here in what they call lens correction. And uh, what this one's going to do, this one will offer us the chance to have it level the photo, meaning I'm going to click only one button. I'm going to click this level button right here. It's going to do its guess at what it thinks it takes to make a level horizon. I don't have to do any dragging the crop tool or measuring. Let's see what happens. I hit level, and let me turn this on and off for you. Before, after. Did a good job. Yeah. 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 When it works, it does an amazing job to me. That because for those who've tried this in Photoshop, in Lightroom, where we drag the crop tool ourselves, it's not that we can't solve this problem. I, I got to stress, we've been solving this for years, but it's awkward. And so if I can have a one button that, that fixes it for me, that goes from here to there, what I should have done, I should add with my tripod, uh, boy, I'm delighted. So I think, I think for folks like me who wish that they had taken the time to level their tripod before they start shooting. <laughs> that those who wish they had looked at the bubble level on their camera or on their, you know, on, on the mount, um, having a one button make it level is pretty amazing. Yeah. Now again, it does come at a price. I, I have to stress here that it makes it level, but it makes it level only because it's cropping something away. That it does not come uh, that, that it's not like it magically adjusted your photo and nothing was lost. The, the solution is still some cropping. Um, but I love that it does the cropping for me. So, so having a one button level, I would have been very impressed with that if I didn't see this trick next. So here we have, uh, here we have a cityscape. Uh, this is uh, downtown Nashville, Tennessee, my hometown. And... Um, I'm going to bring out a new feature in Lightroom 5. Let me bring out a, uh, a set of guidelines or grids. Uh, let me bring out... Let me, um, let me bring us out some guides here. And I've set these guides before I started talking. I set this guide point, I don't know if you can see it, right here so there's a vertical line. Yep. All right, so when I think about buildings, I think the buildings usually should be vertical. So this building in particular, it's the largest, it's the most dominant, the AT&T towers. So it, it sort of disturbs me that in my photo that the building is falling over to the right. That, that doesn't quite seem the way I envision the world should look. So I'm going to turn on the profile correction and then I'm going to hit this button the one that says, well, let's just see what um, vertical, let's see what auto does for us here. I'll hit auto. Auto did okay. Whoa. I think auto did something just amazing there. Yeah. Auto, what they call auto upright. And here again, let me turn these on and off. And, and in fact, I think I'll, uh, I think I'll move my uh, grid line over. Well, yeah, I bet you can see the grid line well enough. Watch the before and after. Before, that's how I actually shot the photo. It's terribly tilted. After, that's a nice straight skyline. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know which math genius at Adobe is responsible for this, but I would love to buy them a beer, a cup of coffee, lunch, uh, because I can't tell you how many cityscapes, mountain ranges, all sorts of stuff I photograph where my photos look like this when I get home. They're always tilted. They're always falling over. And so to, when it works, to have this auto make my stuff stand up straight button, just phenomenal. Right. Amazing to me.
Amazing. Um, and I have to add here, this doesn't work on every photo I've tried it on. Uh, that, that I don't want to overstate it. When it works, it works beautifully. But it doesn't always work. Uh, there is still no substitute for a tilt-shift lens, for leveling the tripod, for the right camera angle. But I don't want to make it sound like software is a panacea for all lousy photos. But I like this photo, and I want straight buildings. And if I can fix it in a single button, boy, I'm happy. Uh, well, here, can I show you one more of this? Let me slide over one, and let me turn off the uh, grid line for now. Because uh, I don't think we need that. Um, maybe I'll turn on a proper grid, though. Let me turn on. This is also, by the way, this is a new trick in Lightroom 5 that we can put a grid or guidelines over our photos. Now, this one uh, on the Nashville theme, this is the uh, inside of the Union Station Hotel. Beautiful old hotel. Used to be a train station. Mm -hmm. Downtown Nashville has a lovely, like, Art Deco, ornate lobby. And I shot this, and I should add here, I am not a professional architecture photographer. A couple of things about this photo that, that should be dead giveaways. First, you see how these columns, these pillars, are like bowed way out to the side? Right. A real architecture photographer would use a tilt-shift lens, would use a camera with a bellows, would use their skills to create nice vertical lines at the time of capture. I failed to do that. This is you know, just me walking around with my camera. But these, these tilted lines, they kind of disturb me. That, that the bowing doesn't fit quite right. So watch this. I'm going to tell it this time, instead of just making it vertical, I'm going to tell it to do a full three-dimensional remapping of this photo. And let's see what it does. Here, let me turn this on and off for you. Ah. Oh, my. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Oh, my. That's, that's cool. <laughs> that's awesome. amazing. Yep. Amazing. This is how I actually shot it. Let me turn the grid off here, just in case it's, it's blocking your view. Um, when I actually shot it, these pillars are falling over. And when I tell it to remap the the whole photo, the whole geometry of the photo, it does that in a single click of a single button. All I did is hit the full upright adjustment and pow, it, now it almost looks like I know what I'm doing, taking pictures of, uh, you know, lobbies and building interiors. Uh, I'm, I'm just, again, the, the math, uh, the, however it's figuring out what to bend and how to bow it, is just astounding to me. Astounding. Um, let, me, let me pause here. Uh, questions? Questions on these? Yeah. David, do you think that the software under the covers is uh, taken into account the focal length so it knows what kind of geometric distortions you know, that lens at that focal length would tend to have? It, this panel, I don't know if you can see this. I'll try and zoom it in. Uh, I'm not even going to try. In, in Lightroom's lens correction panel, mm -hmm. there is an area called profile. And the profile does take into account the lens-specific distortion. So let me turn this on and off. And maybe you can see, you'll see a little bit of sort of barrel vignette, uh, distortion and a little bit of vignetting, I think. When I turn it off, you see how the shape of the photo changes? Sure. Mm -hmm. That's mapped to this specific Canon lens on this specific size sensor. Mm -hmm. So this part of it I know is camera and lens specific. But the math formula that's going on in here, or the math formula is plural, I don't know what all these are doing. Um, uh, they're amazing to me. It just works. It, when it works, it works beautifully. When it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But on a photo like this, I mean, to go from here to there in a single button, it's just astounding uh, when it works. So, you know, for me, these, these two features, uh, a better healing brush and the ability to fix tilted or distorted images, 
for me, these alone make... I, I mean, I hate to say that better software will make me a better photographer. It won't. But it will make the appearance that I shoot better photos <laughs> than I really do. <laughs> uh, you know, I, David, I had a question. In the sure. overlight Lightroom, you could either, for the lens correction, have the lens specific, um, have it do it automatically, or you can do it manual where you had a bunch of sliders. Yep. And you could correct some of this by adjusting the sliders. Um, it wasn't certainly a one button click, but you have to use your judgment. Is this above and beyond? Not only does it do it automatically, but it gives you greater control than the sliders used to give you? Well, I think I, think I would call them this plus that, because I still have the manual sliders. Um, I would think of this as remapping the geometry of the whole image and then you might choose to take it further using what we call the transform sliders. So for example, I might decide to make this photo a little more vertical by using what would be the tilt, like on a, on a tilt shift lens, mm -hmm. this okay. would be the tilt. Um, I might decide for more fisheye uh, distortion or less fisheye, there's more fisheye. Uh, so we still have the same controls in the manual tab, but they can be added on top of what's happening here in the upright controls. And uh, I'll show you a place where we're adding one on top of the other using, using the manual controls uh, is giving me better results than, than I had seen up till now. Uh, how about, let me take, I know this is a landscape show, but uh, watch these, this is a portrait. Uh, earlier in my career, I had the misfortune of shooting weddings. If if you were one of the bride and grooms whose weddings I was went to, I am so sorry. Because uh, <laughs> uh, it turns out it takes a special personality to shoot weddings, and I'm not that guy. Uh, but here, th these are some good friends. We're still friends even after their wedding. Um, we had, uh, you know, they were a really nice couple, good folks. So watch this. I'm going to turn on these controls, and I'm going to tell it to just do its autocorrect thing. Not much happens here. The, the difference from before and after, you can see that before it was a little tilted. Watch that roof line. After, a little less tilted, but not a big, big difference. But in the manual panel now, they've added a new slider called Aspect, and this, I think, is going to be... Well, Julianne Cost, who I th who she teaches for Adobe, I think she's wonderful. She says that anything can be used for good or for evil. And I think that this aspect is really going to be that way. That what I would like to do here is make my friends appear a little taller and a little more angular. Now, if I overdo it, they become bubble heads, right? Like, that looks a little ridiculous, particularly the groom. But a little bit taller and a little little more vertical, oop, a little more vertical, and I think here, compare before, after. But of course, you can take the aspect slider the other way, and this is where we go for evil. You could make them appear a little wider, <laughs> and I, you know, again, I don't think that a lot of portrait photographers, like here, were stretching them in, in evil ways. No, you don't want to add 20 pounds to the bride. No, that wouldn't no, no, be no. good. But a little bit taller, and I think, well, let me see if, let me see if it'll show a side-by-side -side comparison. Nah, I think single view is probably easier. Before, after. See how they seem to be standing up a little straight? And they just, their geometric position is a little more, it's a little more vertical and a little What do you think? I, we, I think this is amazing. We missed some of you there. Sorry, what's that? We missed some of your words there. You were asking oh. a question and we were... We I, I was going to say, I think this is just amazing that I can take a portrait that's diagonal and make them vertical um, and make them a little more angular. And I've probably overdone it for demo purposes. I think the groom looks a little... Little, little distorted, but amazing to me. Uh, want to see another feature? So uh, you have a couple comments here. You right. have 
Anne Abernathy saying, oh my, David Mark, so she likes that. And Sheila Du Bois saying, fantastic shot and tips. So we have we have good remarks going on here, David. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Anne Abernathy. Uh, she's, a, she's a good, good friend and a fantastic photographer. Uh, and, and Crystal Craft is uh, loving your tips, so uh, you, you, got a, you got a little crew here. We're, even though we had gremlins, we got people here. <laughs> well, thanks everyone so much for uh, sticking with us and, and for the positive feedback. Uh, well, here, let me just show off uh, one more feature that, uh, let me show off an old feature and a new feature, one by one. So um, this is a shot that I've been using in my classes for many years. Uh, this is just outside of Las Vegas. It's, this is a Valley of Fire. And I was out there one morning. I was camping out. And I found this really cool rock spiral. And I knew that I wanted to photograph it at sunrise, uh, technically at, at civil twilight, just before sunrise. And uh, I'm happy with my exposure. I'm happy with my composition. But I'm not thrilled because I wish that the sky were darker and the rock spiral were lighter. And so. <laughs> in some ways the tonal range on this photo is backwards that that the human eye is always drawn to brighter uh, warmer more saturated and so here because the sky is brighter I know that I can tell you that this is meant to be the foreground and you can see it but you can't stop your eye from being pulled up there to the top and so what I need to do is sort of flip the the brightness around this needs to be darker and this needs to be brighter so what I can do here let me just darken the whole sky a little bit I'll, first I'll bring a little more detail back into the sky overall brighten up the shadows just a little but then up till now we've used the graduated filter in Lightroom and the graduated filter works like a traditional uh, Gale and Rowell, Singray acrylic filter where you set a transition zone between on and off, on and off for this type of change. So I'm going to set it to make things darker. And I'll say, well, from about here to there, that's meant to be my transition. Oh, I've, I've got to make this a whole bunch darker because you can't see anything happening. Let me set it this way. And we'll add some saturation and we'll add some contrast. And let me back that off just a little bit. Something like that. Let's see. Something like this. So let me let me turn this on and off before. There's the original sky. After. There's the sky as if I had a graduated filter. Uh, actually, I should say a warm, saturated graduated filter uh, or a blue saturated graduated filter over the photo. So here, for before and after, can you see how the sky is now... Uh, the way that closer to the way the human eye would see the sky at sunrise, the sky on the right compared to the yeah. sky on the left. That that the trouble with the way our camera sees the world, I mean, I have to give myself a little credit. I didn't blow out the sky in the original capture. I held detail, but the camera sees that sky much brighter than the human eye sees the sky. So I have to darken the sky down to make it fit that sunrise mood. But now I need to brighten up the foreground. And I've been teaching this for, you know, I've been showing folks this trick for a couple of years where I would say, okay, well, then we take another graduated filter and we run the graduated filter as if it was fill flash and we run it in from the bottom to lighten up the way a flash would the foreground. But, and I like that, but if I could control my flash even more, I wish that the flash had illuminated the rock spiral and not all the way out to the edges. And so up till now in Lightroom, we've only been able to throw these gradients, these graduated transitions, all the way across the photo. Now we can work with the paintbrush, but it's time consuming and it's, it's just not my preferred method. If I'm going to do brush work, I'd rather go to Photoshop or Viveza or something with even more control. But in Lightroom 5, they're adding this feature. They're adding this radial gradient. Uh, it's, it's, and so what this is going to let us do, it's going to let us throw an oval rather than a linear across the photo. Now, I'll have to reposition this a little bit. But if I set this just right, I wow. can throw light just on the rock spiral, and I can feather it 
so that the light doesn't bleed so much out to the edges of the frame. Because I really don't want to illuminate these corners as much as I wish, like in a studio, or if I had all the lighting toys, I would love to have thrown a little spotlight. Let me make this a little more powerful here. Let me throw something like this. I would love to have just hit that spiral with just a little bit more light, something like that. Maybe it's a little overdone. But compare without the spot, without the circle, with the circle. Big difference. Big difference. And here, let me show the before and after. Wow. On the on the left I saw. Amazing. On the right is what I wish I had actually photographed. I wish I'd had a graduated filter. I'm going to go to single view. I wish I'd had a graduated filter to darken the sky. I wish I'd had a snooted spotlight, like a studio photographer would use, to cast a little fill light right into the center of the circle. And so this is a photo that, that I've had and, and I've been happy with for many years. But as soon as I saw this circular graduated tool, this radial, radial filter, uh, I realized, hey, I can do this photo better now than I ever could have before in Lightroom. And I think, I think that a lot of photographers are going to find that throwing a small circle rather than a full from corner to corner, edge to edge graduated transition is going to help when we have round objects. Like the sky is no problem. But this never really fit. It was a, it just, the geometry didn't fit very well. I'll show you one last use of this. Um, one last use. In black and white photography, since you all were, were so kind as to have me in to talk about black and white another day, uh, in black and white, we often talk about vignetting the corners, burning the corners, making them darker. Yep. And, and Lightroom has had a vignetting tool, or a couple of vignetting tools, for a long time. That, in Lightroom, I can do this, or have been able to do this for quite a while, you know, to throw a vignette like that. And now I'm totally overdoing it here, but this sort of vignette, uh, it's not exactly what I want on this photo. That, that I don't want it, that, that just the shape of the factory vignette doesn't quite thrill me. So what I've learned to do or learning to do, I should say, because this is all still so new, is to take these radials and to, um, to throw a radial filter and use it for my vignetting so that I'll have a little bit more, I guess you'd call it control here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw this, uh, this radial filter out there. Let's see if I can do this right. I still have to look up the keyboard shortcuts for this one. Um, so what I need to do is hold the command or control key. Do it right. Hang on. Let me try it again. The keyboard shortcuts are all still new. Um, nope. One more try. And then I'll do it the old-fashioned way. <laughs> Sorry, it was the alt key. Um, uh, what I can do is set this radial filter so that it goes all the way out. But at first, at first, what it's doing is it's making the inside of the photo darker. What I want it to do is the opposite. So I'm going to invert this so that it darkens the outside of the photo. And now I get actual controls like I would have with the graduated filter to lower the highlights, to increase the contrast. Um, and so what I'll do is something like this. And what I'm going to get, I hope, is a better vignette. Let me close this. Uh, this may be real subtle, but before... Do you see? Yeah. yeah, definitely. But do you see how it's really bringing in more detail? Like, watch these snowflakes falling up here. Before. So it's not just that I want the corners to be darker, but I also want to draw out a little more of the detail that's in there. Within yeah, really those corners. It really helps direct the eye, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. like in traditional darkroom black and white photography, we would vignette the corners because there's this visual phenomenon where the human eye does not like to leave through a dark corner. It's attracted to the bright more than the dark. So when your corners are darker, the human eye is compelled, is held, it's, it's forced into the center of the photo. 
And so in this case, I'm forcing your vision in here, and I'm making it harder for you to escape out one of the sides. And to get really carried away, and I probably shouldn't bother doing this, but I can even make two of these. You can have more than one. Um, so I'm going to make a second one here. And let's just see if I can do this. Oh, darn it. The keyboard shortcuts still baffle me sometimes. One more try. One more try, and then I'll just make a second one all on its own. Um. I got a second one. So now I have one and two, but this one I'm going to flip over, and then I'm going to flip over what it does. I'm going to make the center a tiny bit brighter even than it used to be, and a little more contrast and a little more clarity, and we'll just shift this around a little more, something like this. There we go. So that now when I turn these two on and off, oop, hang on, I'm, I'm a little too dark, something like that. Something like that. So now I'm going to further push that illusion before, after. So now your eye should be even more held. In essence, I've thrown a spotlight in the center, and I've vignetted the outside. Let's see if I can show the before and after here. Uh, it may not be that easy to see, but I hope that the one on the right, your eye is pushed right along the line of the chairlift. And on the one on the left, your eye is a little freer to wander around. And unfortunately, it goes, to the left. it goes out of the frame. So this is really what I would love to have done in my darkroom. Uh, vignette the corners, add a little more light to the center. And now in Lightroom, I, I finally have the tools that I needed to do that. Uh, all of this is stuff that I could have done in Photoshop. But, but Lightroom, for me, is fast and efficient. Photoshop is is wonderful, but it's a time my day goes by and very little gets done. <laughs> I get a beautiful photo, but not a lot. Um, so it's the you know for me what Lightroom Five has to offer, it doesn't offer anything radically different than we ever had before. But the ability to get rid of um, stray hairs objects in my photos I don't want, the ability to have things straighter in a single click, to have better vignettes, to have, well, like this one, to have that, that spotlight effect. Mm -hmm. um, I just think that the folks at Adobe deserve such credit for making yeah. what was already a great tool for photographers even, even better. Yeah, definitely. Uh, David, this, this, this uh, stone circle, Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know this. This is in Valley of Fire, is it? This is in Valley of Fire, yeah. Yeah, so if you stand in the center of the stone circle, you really, you actually come out in a vortex in Sedona. They're gonna... <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I, I, have a que I have a question for David. <laughs> David, I have, a que I have a question about the, um, the synchronization. Did you, hello? Hello? Um, is David still there? Whoops. Uh, he'll be back. <laughs> he was just changing, just changing screen. He went to Sedona. Is that what you said? <laughs> mm -hmm. Sedona is um, uh, crystals and lots of interesting um, uh, kind of wavelengths, let's say. <laughs> I, I missed the question on synchronization. I got booted for a second there. Apologies. Yeah, my, my question was, uh, I, I understand uh, the synchronization. I was wondering how different that was in Lightroom 5 with the previous button. So when you use previous, can you select 20 photographs that are in a sequence? I think we lost him again. No, I'm here. I'm back. Okay. At least I can hope you, I'm uh, For example, I've done a series of uh, the same shots from a bridge of... Uh, changing lighting conditions over a river and there's a few changes I want to make in Lightroom can I uh, once I've got one set of them adjusted can I highlight 20 uh, in the film strip view and then use the previous to synchronize all those pictures after the fact is that what that's for Jeff the, the answer is absolutely yes but the vocabulary changes slightly when you highlight 20 of them the word previous will disappear and it will say sync or 
in the uh, de in the library module, we'll see it say sync develop settings or sync develop. It's the same as previous uh, if you synchronize everything, but previous the previous button appears when you only have one photo. When you have a line of photos, 20 of them selected, it's the same button, but they call it synchronize. And it, okay. actually, it, it actually gives you a little more control because previous assumes that you want everything from the last photo on this photo. That, that all the buttons from the last one will be copied to the next one. But when it says sync or sync develop, uh, you get to pick which buttons. So, like for me, often, uh, often I'll have horizontals and verticals. I shoot this way and then I shoot that way. Let's say it's a, a landscape scene. I'll try some horizontals, I'll try some verticals. I don't want to synchronize, for example, the upright command or the dust spots because the, the horizontals and the verticals, they don't match. But I might want to synchronize the white balance, the exposure, so the sync command is even more powerful than previous. Okay, I understand that. I was just curious about the uh, applying after the fact rather than doing them all in real time at the same time. If you've done one photograph to your satisfaction and then you wanted to select another 20 and then just apply what you'd just done afterwards. It, it, that was what I was interpreting the previous to me. Yeah, I, 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 but I think I'm, I got straightened out there. So. I think I think that um, I think that uh, Adobe probably should have labeled the button "Copy the settings from the last photo I worked on." Yeah, I get it. Uh, <laughs> because good. they they yeah, don't act on the tab. <laughs> yeah, but I, I fear that previous implies that the two have to be side by side, or that like they had to have been shot in sequence. Um, they don't. The previous simply says copy from the last one, paste on this one. And even if they were uh, dozens of frames apart, um, it's a copy and paste. Can you save those settings? You could. You could make a preset with those settings. Absolutely. Okay. Um, you can make a develop preset. If, especially if you shoot something where, like say the vignette, uh, like the burning the corners. If you want to use that on a whole bunch of other photos, uh, even photos from, like if you were a wedding photographer, you want to use that on another wedding, a uh, completely different event, building a preset might be a great time saver. Great. Thanks a lot. That's all. Oh, you're very, don't, don't thank me. Thank the uh, brilliant folks who make this, uh, <laughs> this product so wonderfully painless. Uh, I'm, once always the, I'm always happy to thank the person who can make sense of a specific thing to me. Yeah. <laughs> That's what makes it helpful. I deserve, I feel like I deserve no credit here. All I do is push buttons. Some, somebody well, brilliant David, invents them. This is, this is great. And you've had uh, two other people. You have a friend, uh, Tim and uh, Greg Kinney were on there. And um, they're just uh, saying um, great uh, job you've done, and so we want to thank you. And now we uh, want to know when's the next time you'll come back, telling us when the fi five is. When is five supposed to be uh, launched? Well, I, I don't. Again, I don't have any inside information, but my guess would be uh, in the next couple of months. Okay. All right. So now, for those of us who just bought four. <laughs> <laughs> How does that upgrade work? <laughs> uh, well, actually, th this is a very good question, uh, Cara, because there's a lot of confusion about the Adobe's Creative Cloud announcement. Yes, um, yes. So this is uh, good that you so, would clarify this. So Lightroom is, is sort of an anomaly uh, that the Adobe Creative Cloud family of products, which are Photoshop, InDesign, Dreamweaver, uh, Premiere, that they include Lightroom in the full fair creative cloud subscription price. So if you pay for the whole meal deal, they give it to you for free. But they figure there are a lot of folks like me who don't need all those other programs. I don't know anything about web design. Why do I need Dreamweaver? So they sell Lightroom as a standalone and they will continue to sell it as a standalone. So if history is a guide, the upgrade has been about 
79 to $100 over the past couple of years. Um, and I suspect that in a month or two, when they're ready, that you and I would be able to go from four to five for somewhere in that eighty to hundred dollar price range and that that the the whole creative cloud thing makes no difference for someone who's only using Lightroom now if you use Lightroom and Photoshop and Dreamweaver and etc then you might not want to purchase the update upgrade as a standalone but for for most of us who just work like I basically just work with Lightroom it's it's not going to be a, it's not going to be a, a big deal well, I think the new tools, um, and Gray uh, Kenny just commented on that, and your other friend was Tim Cooper, but um, <laughs> that the, to be able to remove objects, that that is an integration of the Photoshop into the Lightroom that was before not, not possible. Right. And for, the, for Tim Cooper, who's a, I should add, is a Photoshop author and one of my, my peers, uh, <laughs> one of the folks I follow around, uh, Tim, I would say not only is it integration of Photoshop, but it, because Lightroom is non-destructive, in some ways it's more forgiving than the way we would have had to do the same work within Photoshop using a duplicate layer and adding complexity to our file. That here, like you can try the content-aware tool, and if you don't like it, you haven't hurt the original in any way. So it really is an amazing bit of technology. Well, that's great. And um, so, uh, Gray Kinney just asked the cost, and you uh, affirmed it would be about eighty nine. And that's only a guess. It's this a guess. Out of the sky, you took one of those cloud shots. <laughs> <laughs> you have no idea. But in uh, the you know, in the past, that's what the upgrade's been. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I can only guess. Um, I can only guess, and I can only guess at when and how much. But I do know that it will be sold as a standalone product. So I've been reading on the internet a lot of confusion. A lot of photographers worried about you know what will happen with Photoshop. For us, just Lightroom users, that's not a worry. And we have Allison Campbell who's asked a question. So this is good that I can multitask here once the gremlins were gone um, and get their questions. But Allison was wondering about cloud information. And actually, your, one of your good friends, Mark Johnson, hi, Mark, if you're watching, um, just wrote a blog post on the cloud information and we'll go ahead and include that link, Allison, in the summary of this so people can see what the differences are and moving over into the cloud, etc. But you know what I see as someone who really hadn't invested in the Photoshop was the the fact that um, the, the five now is going to have some of the things that really were integrated in Photoshop that will make Lightroom the affordable standalone um, editing tool. Yeah. Uh, and I, I would say, hi, Allison. I hope you're liking your new camera. Uh, <laughs> Allison went up to the Arctic with me uh, a few months ago. Oh, wow. Uh, Great. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that Lightroom continues to grow more and more powerful. And, and I have to say, you know, I, I teach Photoshop. I, I love Photoshop. But if I can skip going to Photoshop, I, I'm delighted to just work in one program, get it done, move on to the next photo. Now, I should add here that uh, the new Photoshop, I've not played with it. I'm not a tester on it. But from the demos I've seen, there are some amazingly cool things coming there, too, um, including the ability to, to some degree, fix blurry photos. Uh, so we'll have to find a Photoshop expert to come on next for you all and, and uh, talk about what you know, as one program evolves, what's the sales pitch for the next program? <laughs> okay. Well, great. Well, no, thank you so much, David. And um, we definitely would like to have you come back, so we'll check with you on your uh, schedule, and we'll get you uh, scheduled in here, because uh, the tips that you're sharing, uh, people are really thrilled with. And so now we come to the time in the show where we share a photographer that we been watching on Google Plus and uh, would like to share with our viewers. So I'm going to start over here with Tom. And uh, Tom, tell us about your uh, selected photographer. Um, well, I've selected uh, Derek Kind, 
and um, you have the, the link to his page. He's done some magnificent pictures from Iceland, and I, I've enjoyed that series. Great, great. Now, uh, Margaret. Uh, my featured uh, photographer tonight is Dave Welling, who is one of our new curators at Landscape Photography. He just joined the team, and let's see if I can pull up some of his work here. I'll try to do this screen share. This is always fun for those of you who are listening. Um, we actually do create a circle also of the guests that we've had and the suggested photographers for the week. So, uh, and we'll put a link to all those people on there and creating uh, the circle too. Are you seeing a tiger there? We are. That's beautiful. All right. Uh, this is one of um, Dave's. Uh, he does a lot of landscape photography. And uh, here's one. I, I believe this um, is uh, overlooking Bryce Canyon, uh, a juniper there. And I just love the perspective that he gets on photographs. Uh, this one is almost a little too close for me. Um, <laughs> You know, you say uh, for animals, it's always in the eyes, and I see he's got the catch light in the eye, but folks, this is a rattlesnake, and I just don't know if I'm willing to get that close to the critter, uh, But and, and look how he's poised to, you know, like reach out and, and strike a camera. So uh, just an incredible photographer, but we are so pleased to have Dave Welling as part of the Landscape Photography Curating Team. Um, hope you will share uh, his work. I know you're going to enjoy it uh, for photos like these. Thank you, Margaret. And I went ahead and had mine all set up. This is Cara and um, Andreas Levi. Uh, and many of you know him. He does amazing shots from Germany. It's Hearts, Germany. And uh, we did, did a little practice hangout because he was uh, practicing with his English. And um, But his photo photography, the angles that he shoots from um, are just, just incredible. So, uh, uh, Andreas Levi would be my suggestion. And we'll go now to Jim. So, my suggestion is uh, Michael Austin Kane. Um, he's a pro photographer in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, and uh, here's an example. He, he does uh, a lot of black and white, some color. Uh, and not strictly landscapes. He, he also does some abstract work, but a lot of his work has kind of an atmospheric quality that I really like. Uh, and here's an example. Um, I'll show you something, uh, you know, more, more abstract. Um, and uh, then a third one that shows just a more conventional black and white, but, but really nice work. Um, Hasn't been on Google Plus all that long, but I hope uh, you'll check him out. Uh, links to all of these will be uh, posted and and uh, also uh, in the circle that we'll publish. Um, but yeah, give Michael a view. Great. So Jeff, were were you prepared to share one with us? Well, I'm having some technical difficulty here. I kind of had to rush <laughs> in at the last minute, okay. and I haven't entirely mastered this new flow on Google Plus, so I'm just going to take a quick pass right now. No problem. Okay. I'll be back with us next week. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, David. Well, I, I had one picked out, but um, and I'll, I'll go to her in just a second, but since since uh, since you said that Tim Cooper was typing in the comments, I I feel like I should show off uh, one or two of his photos, because he really has been uh, such an inspiration and such a big part of of what I know about photography. Uh, let's see if this will work here. Uh, hang on just a second. Um, does that uh, does that bring up one of his photos? Yep. Yeah. That's yeah, we, we see a beautiful photo there. Yeah. That's yeah. great. He uh, he. Well, Tim Cooper was one of my teachers. Uh, he's someone who I love to travel with. I always learn from. He was a darkroom master. He's a phenomenal landscape photographer. Mm -hmm and he teaches awfully good classes 
in the Washington D.C. area as well, and all over the country. Um, really, uh, as good a source of, of knowledge and inspiration in photography as, as I've ever met. But the photographer I was going to show off tonight uh, was actually a student of ours, of Tim's and mine's, uh, and it's my friend Jamie Davis. Uh, she lives in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and uh, Jamie, I love her. Oh, let me start the screen share again. Uh, hang on one second here. Uh, Jamie's been doing a project lately called For the Love of Trees that are all just tree photography and I think they're all appropriate on Tree Tuesday. A tree Tuesday <laughs> and they're each they're each uniquely marvelous. Um, she's uh, really talented and just has a wonderful way of of running with themes. Um, she play she she does a lot for the various photo themes. Uh, so my my pick, uh, Jamie Davis. If you haven't seen her work, one to watch. Well, that's great. And then you, you come back in, uh, David, and put the link for Tim Cooper. Since we'll just say uh, that you, Jeff uh, deferred to you. So uh, <laughs> so we have our there we go. So you got two for one there. So wonderful, wonderful. Thanks for sharing Jamie's trees. Oh, uh, they're so they're now, marvelous. <laughs> yes. So now here's our, our next shows that are coming up. On Tuesday, June 4th, we'll have Dan Hughes back again, um, and he will be talking about the HDR EFX Pro 2 plugin. So uh, as we keep adding and adding to our um, arsenal of tools to create the perfect photo. That will be great. And then uh, far out in the future, August 27th, we have Mark Johnson coming back again talking about Photoshop. So, uh, And we'll get you scheduled in, um, uh, David, and thank you so much for coming. And a note to everyone, and we will include this in our um, summary, that June 29th, it's a Saturday, is the Google Plus uh, second anniversary photo walk. And so any of you who are watching can sign up to host one in your area or you can attend one in your area. So it's just amazing. All over the world we have events flowing in. In, and we want to encourage you all to participate. We will be having some special um, gifts uh, that will be announced later. So just everyone sign up and you have a great week. And uh, thank you again, uh, David, for spending your time. Appreciate all of our uh, watchers for going through our gremlin. Um, it, it, you would have thought this was Alien of Abduction Friday, you know, <laughs> with all the, the mess we had. So so thank you, and we will see you on June 4th. <laughs> Peace. Good thank Goodbye, you so everybody. much, y'all. I really Goodbye, appreciate it. Bye, everybody.